episode two of Storytelling, presented by the Dallas Swing Dance Society. I'm Ursula Hicks. Each month, we will bring you interviews with dancers, teachers, and musicians within the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex to provide a bigger picture of the swing dance culture we love. In this episode, we spoke with Kat and Jerry Warwick, who both run the Wednesday night dances at Sons of Herman Hall in Deep Ellum, and are instructors at the Rhythm Room Dance Studio in Dallas, Texas. We discuss how they found Lindy Hop and Blues, their love story and partnership, their involvement with DSDS, Frankie 95, their heart behind the DJ house parties, and how Steve, the swing sloth, became our favorite mascot. Kat and Jerry have been teaching for over 20 years and continue to contribute to our local scene today. This is their story. Today we have Kat and Jerry. Thank you guys so much for being a part of our storytelling talk today. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Doing good. Cool, cool, cool. So we just kind of wanted to take time to um, appreciate you by asking you 5 million questions about your lives and your involvement with dancing here in Dallas, um, because it's a really interesting love story, I think, as well as your dance journey, um, and then just things that you were doing prior to dancing. So the first thing I kind of want to ask you is a very basic question. Where are you guys from originally? Uh, I'm from here. I grew up in Garland and live in Dallas. So when I started dancing, I was in Garland. Neat. And you, Jerry? And I grew up in the Panhandle of Texas. Uh, spent most of my youth in Amarillo uh, before going to A&M. And then I did a six-year sentence in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then moved to Dallas in 1986. You might explain that word sentence. <laughs> oh, well, I, I had to go to work in Tulsa for six years. <laughs> Awesome. He wasn't behind bars while he was there. No, no, no. <laughs> cool. Yes, let's make sure we clear that up. Jerry is not a felon. And what did you guys do before you found dancing? Like, what were you doing with work and things like that? Um, I was in sales. I sold printing. And I had been working with Boy Scouts as one of the scout advisors on the high adventure treks and things. So my, my pastime was hiking and horse trekking and teaching the kids. Um, I needed something different when I found dancing, which was great. <laughs> um, and I was working with, at Hewlett Packard. That was, I have a degree in computer science and I worked at Hewlett Packard as a professional uh, engineer for them for 20 plus years when I discovered swing dancing. Uh, I actually had country and Western dance before that for about 20 years before I discovered swing dancing. I did country and Western dancing. And then when I found swing dancing, it was all over. I, I just did swing dancing exclusively seven nights a week, quite honestly. He was addicted. Yeah. Yeah. Got the bug, as we like to say, for sure. Yeah. That's and awesome. we had both just recently gotten through divorce. So um, having an outlet where we could be social, but still in a relatively safe environment was fabulous. Yeah, definitely. Could you guys um, tell us a little bit about what it would have been like to dance in Dallas during the revival, like the clubs, who were like some of the musicians or favorites that you guys would hear pretty much, like you said, seven nights a week, there was pretty much dancing. <laughs> well, when He's I the right one to well, answer that. <laughs> when I first started, there was a club that did uh, swing dances seven nights, or I think they had did five nights a week, something like that. They were closed like two nights, called the Sandcastle, which was over on um, uh, White Rock near... Uh, not White Rock Lake, but near uh, Bachman, Lake? Bachman Lake over by uh, Love Field, um, right over there and Northwest Highway area. And then um, that was where I went all the time. But there were lots of other uh, clubs that were doing stuff like the Red Jacket, which was on Lower Greenville. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a place where Johnny Reno played every Thursday night. And there were lots of folks that went down there. There were uh, there's one particular CD that was actually recorded there that has, uh, you can hear in the background noise, some of the local Dallas dancers um, that were, you can kind of hear them making little hoots and hollers. Uh, and then there was a couple of other places that um, we went to through the years because the Sandcastle didn't stay open for, they were only open a year, even though I was there 11 months of that time. Um, and then... You couldn't keep them in business? No, I tried real hard. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, then there was like the Gypsy Tea Room, which was mm -hmm. uh, in Lower Greenville, or not Lower Greenville, in uh, Deep Ellum. That's where I would go dancing. Um, that's that's the one I went to. Yeah, Gypsy Tea Room. And then there was uh, 
There were a couple of other places. I can't remember. The, the Velvet Hammer was another club that people would go to. Uh, so there were about three or four that were primarily swing dance places to go to. And you could quite honestly almost go out every week of the night or every night of the week. There you go. That's really cool. And then I'm assuming also, based off of our interview with Elaine, like it was also a lot of live music. And I know there's kind yeah, of like yeah, yeah, yeah. a resurgent now, even like with dancers, I mean, pre-COVID, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to find, you know, live music to dance to, which is really cool to see a little bit of that culture kind of mm -hmm. make a resurgence, even with our generation of dancers now. Yeah, Back in that time, the, the bands that were popular then some of them are still around today. For example, um, Johnny Reno and the Lounge Kings, you can still see Johnny Reno. Um, well, on normal circumstances, you can see Johnny Reno at Scat Jazz over in Fort Worth. Um, Ricky Derrick, who plays, he's in the, a Dallas boy, lives in, right here in the Lakewood area. Um, he has a band that plays in several different varieties and he um, is still around, but he was, he was one of the big ones back then. Uh, you had a, in the big band side, there was a couple of, of artists. There was one guy by the name of Hunter Sullivan, who has a big band. And he still shows up at some places like the Clover Club, I think is one place where he shows up. But we don't, because it's a big band, we don't normally see him in like DSDS or other places because hiring a big band is expensive because you've got 20 musicians that mm -hmm. you have to pay. And so it's usually a little bit harder to afford uh, it, it's harder to to get those guys and pay them a decent wage uh so they're usually in corporate gigs and large clubs and that kind of stuff that can pay a little bit more uh but there's lots of of live music the you know back in those days it was there was a thing called neo swing that was that was the style of swing music that was being played being played on the radio the uh, big bad voodoo daddies and the cherry popping daddies and the uh, um, uh, Royal Crown Review mm -hmm. and Indigo Swing. These are the bands that had uh, songs that were being played on the radio. Uh, that was I think ninety nine was actually the year also that um, uh, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy was actually part of the halftime entertainment mm -hmm. at the Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, so they were mm -hmm. part of the the entertainment they weren't the only band but they were like one of two or three bands that played during the super bowl so yeah lots of live music that was going around uh that we could see at clubs mostly i mean most people didn't um we didn't necessarily it, it, it was that was about the time dsds started so we had some live bands but not very many um uh, like once every couple of months or something like that would be able to get a band in at DSDS. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, that's awesome, you guys. And I think that's what's so interesting, or like what's important for us is like it's nothing like like we like a lot of the greats that we dance to are like the radio tunes, mm -hmm. um, but there's just a different energy when we get a chance right. to you know dance to live music and they start connecting with us and stuff. Like it kind of yeah. gives us that that sense of organic feel of like mm -hmm. what the original dancers would have experience for sure so cool yeah um let's see now here's my favorite part how did you two meet oh <laughs> <laughs> it was the era of uh, era of bright clothing for the men and um stockings and garters and frilly dresses for the ladies so i don't think it was my first dance um my first dance was a really like fancy dance and i think he was out of town but the first time I saw him, he was wearing chartreuse pants with chartreuse suspenders and tie and socks. And I thought, oh my gosh. Go ahead, keep talking. <laughs> he's, he's running away. He's got to go look for it. <laughs> um, anybody that is brave enough. Oh, he's got him. <laughs> like, stand by. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and he, he knows this is my, my story, go-to story. Um anybody that is this size man who can dance and can wear colors like that and make it work i've got to get to know this guy so i kind of i kind of started spending more time in his general area mm -hmm. he didn't notice me <laughs> oh 
oh no <laughs> she was another lady at the you know that's the, the dances that i danced with so he had a lot of ladies that like dancing with him mm -hmm. <laughs> it was not at all unusual for people to say that they would sometimes say that i had a harem of women that kind of followed me around kathy was part of that harem but yep. nonetheless there was like five or six ladies that would you know pretty much be at my table all the time or you know, around me when we were dancing and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. We had a thing that we would um, call a safety dance. So if any of us of that group, and we were all very good friends, but if any of us in that group had a really bad dance with somebody that was yanking us around or just, just a bad dance, we would go to Jerry and say, Jerry, can you give me a safety dance? And Jerry would reset so he would bring everything back down to the basics and lead appropriately and let us kind of reset and get back into our groove. It was really, it was really mm -hmm. pretty nice. That's so cool. Man, that's a concept we should do. It's kind of like when you go out though, granted what we do is very different from club life, but it's just kind of like, oh, wink, wink. I need a, <laughs> yeah. I need somebody to support me right now. And some right. of those guys in the club thought, oh, I can swing dance. Oh, no, you can't. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. So then, Jerry, when do you remember meeting Kathy? <laughs> uh, it actually probably was maybe about two or three weeks after we had first danced, probably. Because mm -hmm. um, I remember, um, I think the first night she met me might have been uh, at um, up in Addison. There was a... Um, place up there sambucas used to be mm -hmm. up used to be a sambucas up in addison and they had a big band night carrie richards was the name of the band leader uh but it was a big night a big night and i'm pretty sure that was probably the first night that kathy met me and i probably didn't really begin to recognize or know her remember her name we'll put it that way yeah I'm until the same way until probably people. a couple of maybe a dance or two later at uh DSDS or maybe it, you know the red jacket or someplace when all of a sudden it's go hey you're pretty good and we started started I started recognizing that she I liked dancing with her let's put it that way <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and I know there's like some in-between stuff of just kind of like flirting and stuff we don't have to get into all of that but um, yeah, but well, then eventually it got to the point where you guys started dating and stuff yeah. Um, were you guys as well as dance partners when you were dating or yes. what did that kind of look like? We yeah. actually were dance partners before we started dating. Mm -hmm. um, we were, Kathy likes to tell the story of, we were in Austin for an event that for, uh, that uh, Forum Floor was putting on. Um, and they had brought in some instructors from out of town and we were in rotation. And I, me and Kathy, had, we did not go down there together, but a whole group of Dallas folks went down there. Yeah. And we were rotating through rotations, and and I I stopped her at some point and I said, you know, I I I have something I would love to ask you, and she was I, I she's like, oh boy, he's gonna ask me out on a date, and I said, would you like to be my dance partner? <laughs> and it's like, well, I can I can maybe make this work, but yeah, but so being dance partner was great because he had been dancing a year or more longer than me. So I was going to get to learn all this stuff he already knew. Now, now mind it was you, pretty cool. mind you, we weren't that good. I mean, we thought we were that good. <laughs> of course we thought we were that good. But imagine, uh, remember how good you were um, a year after you had been dancing. You know. I won my first comp, so no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I mean, well, that's you know, true. I'm yeah, totally kidding. You got a point. Yeah, no, it's, it's terrible when you're you watch. Like, <laughs> you think you're so yes, cool and then you watch it and you go, no, I was not. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, but we, you know, we thought we were pretty good. And, it, you know, in the eyes of a lot of our peers, we, we were good dancers, you know. But there was lots of improvement to come later, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And so we uh, we were dance partners for a while. And then... <laughs> a month and a half. Yeah, I, I we dated for a while. And then it's like, this isn't working. We were both going through divorce or had just gone through so, but we stayed dance partners. Yeah. And then some other things transpired, you know, time passes. Kids, that's what good counseling is for. Oh. <laughs> that's the reason we were Back able to, to keep that, Jerry. Being, that's the reason we were able to keep being dance partners and after friends. we broke up. Yes. 
Yeah. When you when you realize there's nothing wrong with this human, it's just not the right human for me right now, it makes life a whole lot easier. <laughs> yeah. So we stayed dance partners. Yeah. And uh, eventually we ended up back together and mm -hmm. got married. But we stayed best friends and dance partners through all of those ups and downs while we were both, you know, learning how to be better humans ourselves. That was probably over the course of about three years. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Well, we just love your love story, or at least I do. I don't know how many other, <laughs> other people do. Alex is over there. Alex is probably watching this video going, oh, God. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> taking notes. <laughs> that's all I'm doing do is this. taking notes yeah. here. But, I mean, that's right. a lot of good life lessons, too. And I think that's something, honestly, kind of behind the curtain of just, like, conversations with friends and stuff at events, especially those who, like, try to partner with someone, but you get those attachments. But that's the thing is like separating the dance from real life or mm -hmm. like what I love what you guys say on Wednesday nights is like saying yes to a dance is not a date. So, you know, it's just, especially if you're new to the environment of the dance is to understand like, yes, things can bloom if you talk mm -hmm. about it, but not right. to assume, for example, a yeah, dance no means that we are on a date or like they're into me, you know, like that takes separate conversations and or counseling. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had some of my most amazing dances with people that were on opposite sides of the fence on everything we believe in and we would never be good friends. Had amazing dances. Mm -hmm. And then I've had other dances that maybe weren't that great, but, you know, the person was just magical to me. Mm -hmm. So that's the other good thing about this dance is we can be friends and socialize with a lot of different people. Um and we know that's all it, that's it's just dance we're not mm -hmm. gonna agree with each other on everything and when we leave the dance everybody's okay for the most part yeah. things are interesting this year <laughs> yeah the uh, right. yeah we used to um we'd go when we'd go to the the weekend events the lindy fest the chicago exchange the san francisco events whatever you would almost always come back with what we would call dance crushes mm-hmm people that you really love dancing it just felt so good and magical you know and they weren't your girlfriend or their boyfriend or anything like that but yeah. it was like oh my god i'm in lust with that person when i'm on the dance floor in the dance and it's like once you're done you're like oh my god thank you once again and you're off someplace else but it's like yeah. you reminisce and it's like there's still some of those people that i you know we don't travel as much as we used to but that we still connect with, you know, that I'll just say, I really miss dancing with you. And they're like, oh, me too. Mm -hmm. And it may have, it may be 10 years ago that we danced last, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. That's awesome. And I mean, to also give Jerry more credit from an earlier comment, I mean, I would hear, hear rumors of Jerry having the best swing outs in Dallas. So I mean, <laughs> it might've taken a year or two, but I would hear about Jerry was like the king of the swing out. So here locally. So he yeah, did could, swing out could, nice. knowledge. There was a, there was a, actually a, a, along that line and, and you may, I may have told you this story, but I'll repeat it for the rest of the world. Um, there was an event in California in Oakland, Oakland oh, swing gosh. dance festival where a guy had been watching me. There was an, a balcony above the dance floor and apparently had been watching me and he comes down and he says, man, you are so smooth when you're dancing. Your swing outs look lovely and, and just amazing. How do you, how do you do that? I mean, how do you swing out like that? And I was like, tell you what, if you've got $10,000 and you're willing to go to lots of uh, workshops and exchanges and take lessons, you too can have a swing out just like this. So I would say, I would say it was the $10,000 swing out. Yeah. Cause you had all the travel, you know, if you start adding up all the travel expenses, all the event registrations and Your that was shoes. back. Yeah. And that was back when you could get into an event for a hundred bucks, you know, nowadays yeah. it's probably more like a $25,000 swing out, you know, <laughs> but by the time you have all that, you add it all up. Mm -hmm. You know, going to the dances and getting in and all those. Yeah, it adds up. Mm -hmm. Just like any other hobby, it's going to add up. Yep. You know, I've, I've thought about that recently, too, just in relation to, like, how things add up. Because, mm -hmm. like, for example, like, I remember starting dancing and or consistently and, like, hearing about, like, Dallas people go to Denton and then we would go to Fort Worth. Like, you know, there was dancing at least in, within the Metroplex a couple of times a week or at least three times. But now I think about the gas price. Like this is, at least from my standpoint, like gas is like $1.50. Like, of course you could like easily travel everywhere and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, even within 
the cities, but then yeah, even like I'm sure cost of travel and stuff is so much more affordable now in comparison. Like if you think yeah. back, like it's just so crazy. It does tend to rack up, but also it's worth it because if it's mm-hmm. a road trip, you know, you're splitting gas, but you're also spending quality time mm-hmm. with those oh, people. Yeah. Friends. And there's people you end up like, like there's so many people I've know I've never began to even talk to, but we convinced them to come to an event. And we're like, yeah, ride with us. And you get, you know, you gain friendships from that, which is really right. neat. So the cost is like <laughs> cries, but the payout is still good. And, it's mm-hmm. just and with, like, you know, with any hobby anybody gets into, there's going to be equipment, there's going to be training, there's going to be events, it's going to add up. So dancing is no different. And I, I think when people get into dancing, they, they forget that it's a hobby and hobbies do cost money. So that's, that's something I think more people mm-hmm. were aware of, would be aware of. Uh, the dances are not expensive, you know, but, but if, depending on how much energy you want to invest, there's going to mm-hmm. be that financial investment as yeah. well. Then you got the cost of all the, like the vodka and oh. the, the bourbon and the. <laughs> no, it's true. Preach it. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> Trust me, that's going to be a question later in our lightning round. <laughs> uh, cool. So Jerry, because I like, I mean, I like all the uh, stories of like how people meet not only the legends, but just like thinking of like our contemporaries in the sense of um, professionals that dance nowadays. But then I know you've had a chance to know certain professionals that we look up to now when they were young, hot teenagers. So could you tell us a little bit about (laughs) when Sky Humphreys got to stay with you and like the girls and Uh, how they were fawning over him? Yeah, the, the, um, Elaine Hewlett and her partner, Jeff Miller at the time, um, put on the the Lindy Hop Body Shop, which is the mm-hmm. event we now put on annually. But it, back then it was back in like 98, 99, 2000, I think was the last one. And on the, I think the one in 2000, uh, they actually paid for all of Minnie's Moochers to come in, which was a young dance troupe out of New York, which included, um, probably about uh, eight of the top uh, Lindy Hop instructors that are now what you may think of as old folks because they're probably in their mid-30s now at least, <laughs> at least uh, almost 40s. Um, but Sky Humphrey was one of those. And and I had a large house that I was renting uh, here in the Lakewood area of Dallas. And I had all of the moochers staying at my house, which meant there were like, I think there were 10 or 12 of these teenage dancers. The oldest one was 21, uh, I think. And all the rest of them were like 16, 17, that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, And they were staying in my house. It was wall to wall air mattresses on in three bedrooms. So they, I just said, there's air mattresses, go forth and sleep. (laughs) Um, And they had been used to traveling. So that, that was no problem for them. But one of the things that was really interesting was that every night after after the late night dances and everything go back to the house sit on the couch and then sky humphreys who at the time was probably 16 17 um all the girls had the big crushes on him Mm -hmm. and uh he had some mix cds cds that had mixes of songs on it and he'd put it in my cd deck and then he was like he'd like select a song and he had put it turn it on and he go oh yeah i love this and there was like three girls ranging in age from about 16 to probably 28 that were on the couch and they were like his basically his dance partners they're all like sitting over there going <laughs> ask me ask me uh and he would put on a song and then he would reach over and he grab one and he would dance with them and these girls were just like all fawning all over him and i'm like going oh my god you know, I'm, I didn't pick up this dance until I was in my forties. And here's this little teenage boy. That's just got all the girls, you know, just fawning all over. He has, I mean, it, 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 and to my appearance or to what I could see, he really didn't have any idea what effect he had on the girls. The girls were just like fawning all over him. And he's just like, Hey, you, you're a dance partner. Come here, dance with me. He was dancing. And then he had, he had put on another song. He had dance. And this, he danced with these girls until like four o'clock. I think I finally had to kick them out. Um, so we could get ready for the next day, but it was just funny. I, I actually, I don't know when they slept. Yeah. I actually nicknamed after that weekend, I would watch sky dance. And one of the things he would do 
is he would do a swing out and in the middle of a, at the end of a swing out. So on like basically six, seven, eight, one, two, he would go out and he would literally go onto the floor and do a little circle of himself and then get back up and lead this next swing out. And so I was like, what he, why, what is he doing? And I, I started nicknamed him a uh, rag mop because he would mop up the floor literally <laughs> uh, while he was dancing. He would get down on the floor, run, you know, turn around, spin spinning. around, hop back up, and then go right back into dancing. And, uh, but yeah, it, it was just absolutely hilarious to have all these teenagers staying at my house who were just like rock star, you know, everybody in the nation knew who these kids were. Yeah, they were, they were good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And a little shameless plug for my friend Ryan Swift, uh, which is interesting just for the viewers of this um, episode. I don't know if I can't remember if he did one with Sky because I know another mini moocher would have been Ramona, I think, because yes. all those Pika mm -hmm. kids um, that they kind of talk about like their teenage years and like how interesting it is um, for them in a sense of this kind of like rock star ness. Mm -hmm. But they're so young, like if you can imagine. And then I think even Naomi in one of her interviews was talking about a lot about um how interesting it is like here we are with this revival or this concept of this dance you know coming about in the popular sense i wish to say because again the dance never died but the popularity mm -hmm. growing um that roughly everybody started dancing around the same time but you see but there's more of a shift in the sense of like who advanced faster <laughs> than right. the others oh, yeah. you know and so, of course, because the kids are young and able to spin on their knees and things like, you know, like there's just interesting things about how they became rock stars and like them also practicing as much as that they as they did. And I think for those of you guys listening, maybe we'll put that in the description box um, is just Ryan Swift has a lot of cool track podcast episodes and he talks to Ramona oh, and yeah. some of the other people who were teenagers during the revival and like their experiences going out and teaching, you know, even at age 16, you know, yeah. at, can you imagine? Place, so you know, it's really interesting. A year old trying to teach a forty-year-old how mm -hmm. how awkward that would be for the sixteen-year-old. Yeah. Like okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're my parents' age, but I'm I'm going to teach you how to dance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that's an interesting perspective to think about. Is like when did we find this dance, or at least then, like when people found the dance, what age? But then, mm -hmm. like the experiences you have with that is very yeah. telling. Nice. All right. So this next series of questions, I'm going to kind of blob together because I can't remember quite your timeline of like between involvement with Sons versus DSDS. Mm -hmm. And then also when you guys found blues dancing in the middle of that, mm -hmm. all of that stuff, like if you can kind of help cool. iron. Blues was stuff. first. Well, so let her answer, okay. let her ask questions. Yeah. Well, oh, so that was pretty much it. So when did you guys get involved with Sons? When did you guys start blues dancing? Um, and then when did you get more involved with DSDS, i.e. ACME and President, former President Jerry so, Warwick? So going through the real, the chronology of, of events, 1999 DSDS was formed. Mm -hmm. We were part of the forming committee. We weren't part of the original board of directors, but we were part of the forming committee. Uh, I think I was member number 25. Uh, was my, that, was what, that was the number that was on my membership card. Uh, back in those days. Um, I don't and, remember what mine was. Yeah, hers would have probably been 27 or 28, so who knows. Um, but the, so we started, we were there at the start of DSDS. Um, we weren't really on the board for the first couple of years. Mm -mm. Uh, we were just organizers and dancers. Um, yeah, we helped put on the events, yeah. the big ones, the small ones. The, the events that they had, we had we had events once every three months. We had uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, well, actually, we had months, we had uh, dances every month and a big event every three months. So every month there would be a, a large dance that was at the Carionis oh, oh, right. uh, Opera Rehearsal Facility, or as we like to call it, the DORC, the Dallas Opera Rehearsal mm -hmm. Center. They didn't um, like that. No. Um, <laughs> But those were once a month dances. Um, and then once every three months, there would be a big theme dance where there would be decorations and live bands and all of that kind of stuff. Um, that would, There was one of them that was at the Garden Center, I know for sure. Um, mm -hmm. So there were, those events went on. During that time was when 
live or music or dancing at clubs began to diminish because the clubs began to realize that swing dancers don't drink enough and not enough um, we drink too much we fall down yeah and <laughs> and so and so they weren't making money on us asking for water all the time uh, and we weren't tipping them for water and so it was one of those things where in essence the club scene went away and that's when we decided we developed I actually came up with the phrase of swing on a string, SOS dances that we have at the Salmon Center. Now DSDS started doing these swing on a string. And the swing on a string meant it was on a shoestring budget. It was just a place to go dance. There was a dance floor and there was a DJ playing music. There's no decorations. No There's frills. No frills, none of that stuff. So um, it was just a way. And those were three weeks out of the month. And then one week we had the monthly dance right and so and we would decorate for the monthly dance we mm -hmm. would hang up lights and put tablecloths on mm -hmm. tables and every month it was just a, a nice night out for everybody everybody and, dressed up and originally that's the reason why dsds only has dances on the second third and fourth saturdays because the first saturday we were at the dallas opera rehearsal center and then and salmons was okay with that because they could do the ballroom dances on the first Saturday of the month. And that's still true today, even though the, the other dances went away. So there were, at the time, four dances a month. That just kind of went away when the, when the popularity of the large dances that were at the Dallas Opera Rehearsal Center went down. And the, but the swing on the string continued to be popular. And about the music styles during that time, there was Neo Swing, which was pretty up-tempo music. However, that slowly, or I won't say slowly, it, it rather quickly uh, melded into what was called groove swing. And the average tempos of music that was being danced to at swing events was probably in the neighborhood of about 120 beats a minute, 120 to 130 beats a minute. Mm -hmm. And so it was really pretty slow music. It was during this time that um, I began to develop a style of dancing which quite honestly had no other name than a jerry special mm -hmm. um later it we realized jerry special was basically blues dancing but it yeah. was improvisational dancing it wasn't swing outs it wasn't east coast swing it was basically movement across the floor improvisationally blah 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 and we started to uh at about 2001 we began to go to like the bone which was a club in deep ellum mm -hmm. uh, that had blues music on tuesday nights and we would go to a blues jam they had a nice deck up on the roof you could sit outside it was a great place to go to it was cool because when they'd set it up and they'd have fans going because it was summer but there would be us then the band then the dallas skyline and it was just like the visual was so cool oh yeah it was beautiful and so that went on that that style of dancing, um, it wasn't until I saw a video of the ALHC in 2000 that I saw a, a, a good friend of ours, uh, Ogden Sawyer, who's a large man just like me, uh, was dancing and he was in a competition called blues dancing. And it was at that point that I called Kathy and I said, look, he's doing a Jerry special. We must be doing blues dancing. <laughs> and so that was the first time we actually knew that what we were doing was something akin to blues dancing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. We began to realize that, you know, with refinement, it actually was blues dancing. Um, but we didn't really start teaching blues until about 2004. And so that's when blues dancing started. Um, about at 2000. Least, at least yeah, for us. Well, at least for us, yeah, yeah. in the Dallas area. And then about 2005 is when we got involved with Sons of Herman. 2004, 2005, we got involved at Sons of Herman as uh, substitute teachers because once a month the, te the instructors that were teaching there wanted to take off. They were beginning to become West Coast Swing dancers and they really didn't care that much for Lindy Hop and East Coast Swing anymore. And so they wanted to take a week off every month. And so for about probably not more than about six or eight months, we would go and teach once a month 
at Sons when they took a night off. And then in about 2006, 2005, they said, they basically said, we're done. You guys want to take over? And so we took over teaching at Sons. Um, about the same time, I became president of the Dallas Swing Dance Society. And um, at the time, the Dallas Swing Dance Society had their meetings on Wednesday nights. Um, and because that meant that once a month, we would have to not teach at Sun so we could go to the DSDS meeting. After less than a year, we changed the meeting date at DSDS to like Thursday. Yeah. And because so we got tired of having to hire substitutes to come in and teach for our gig yeah. that we had every week. Yeah. And everybody else was fine with that. So, so anyway, we, we, uh, was president, I was president of Dallas Swing Dance Society from 2006, seven and eight. And I think I left in January of 09. I think it was when I left something yeah. like that. And when I joined Acme. the, yeah, yeah, I joined the board at the same time. It was 2005. Um, and I joined for one specific purpose. Uh, when I looked at the dance, we had social dancing and we had um, competitive dancing because there were competitions um, and there were classes. But the one thing that wasn't happening was performance dancing. And that was part of the original dance. Uh, you've got these movies with the performers, you know, Whitey's Lindy Hoppers. And so there wasn't an outlet at that time for Dallas dancers to do that. So I joined the board so that I could create Acme Swing Company. Now we didn't have a name for it when I joined the board, but, um, and I stayed on the board as long as I was managing and in charge of Acme Swing. Um, so we started that up in the spring of 05 and I managed it for eight years, I think. And we did like over 20 performances a year on average, probably between 20 and 30 a year. And then we entered three competitions and that was in towards the later, more towards seven year seven or eight. And on all three competitions, we placed. So I was so proud of the team. They did really good work. Um, and Acme is no longer around, but there is another dance team in Dallas that fulfills that or Dallas Fort Worth area that is now fulfilling that. Um, so it's cool. It was a fun journey for lots of people over those years. Lots I was about to say my first exposure to swing was actually because of a company member of Acme Amber. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I forget the maiden name now. <laughs> but yeah, but I remember her teaching at my old dance studio awesome. and Amber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And um, her teaching my best friend's parents and they would teach at our studio and I was like, where can we do this? And that's how I heard about Salmon's. So sure enough, like I, you probably were president by that time, by the time I was there. Cause I was definitely, I think the first time I went dancing might've been Oh five, somewhere around there, you okay. know, that's so, mm -hmm. and it was like a handful of times and then I didn't find it again until later, but that's kind of cool. Like we just kind of ping pong, like miss each other yeah. in life. And then mm -hmm. now yeah. here we are, you guys put up with me. <laughs> it's really yeah. neat. So cool. So you, now we kind of got us. That's good. I'm sorry. You still tolerate us. That's good. Oh, stop it. No, I love you guys to death I'm here <laughs> because of you guys. It's so great. Um, so uh, let's see. So this is going to be kind of like an all in one question, just talking about your involvement or events that you would have gone to. I know you've mentioned like Lindy Fest and stuff, but you guys also put on the uh, what was originally called and also because of certain I'll just put a disclaimer out there for a certain reasons people didn't care for the name due to its um, relation to cultural stigmas and things. But you guys mm -hmm. had what was called Gypsy House Party that you later turned into, uh, what was it? DJ Dance House, House Party, Party Blues? DJ, DJ, DJ House Party. House Party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of tell us about the genesis of that event that you guys would put on and the heart behind it and why. Uh, well, let's see, it, it kind of goes back to 2004 yeah. Right about that same time when There's we started. There's a backstory. Yeah. We started teaching blues. Um, we were invited to teach at uh, some events around the country um, by some of the other blues instructors that were, that was just kind of, the blues scene was just beginning to form. 
And so we had, um, we decided that we wanted to put together our own event here and it was called Red, White and Blues. Uh, and that was 2004, five and six. Mm -hmm. And we brought instructors from around the country in, we brought DJs from around the country in, we hired local bands. Um, and so we had, the, it was a workshop weekend for blues. Um, and we did that for three years. Um, unfortunately, it was not hugely successful. We didn't lose a lot of money, but we also didn't make enough money that Kathy wouldn't be afraid we'd miss a mortgage payment. I was really worried. So the, the event was success, successful in that everybody learned, everybody had a good time. Uh, from that aspect, it was fabulous. But yeah, the numbers... Every time we did this, we were risking the mortgage, and I just got to where I, I was beyond my ability to handle, Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. So we quit that in 2006, and then it, Austin actually picked up the ball, and they formed the Austin Blues Party mm -hmm. immediately thereafter. They with came to us blessing. with our help and blessing. They, yeah. they hired us to come and help them set it up and get it going. And then in 2009, we started this thing, this idea that, we would have an event that could possibly be done around the country. It might, would travel like a gypsy, okay? So it would, mm -hmm. it would go around the country and people would flock to it, you know, all over the place and you could hire us to come in and we'd bring in the entertainment and the DJs and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, so, and you create your own basically camp for your people. Uh, what would they enjoy? So we would handle our end of it and they would handle their end of it yeah. and it would be a, a merging of you know of people yeah unfortunately uh you know not all ideas uh come to what they hope we hoped they'd be so it ended up just being it never actually went anywhere except to sons of herman hall um so it never actually traveled it never was it never was the gypsy event that we thought it might be that didn't have a home uh it began to be a an event that just happened every year at in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, and then now, there was quick disclaimer. Yes. When we named it that, we did it because of the traveling and yes. the, the nomad nature of dancers. Um, later on, we found out that that wasn't an appropriate name to use anymore. That's when we changed it later. Yeah, yeah. So for anybody we offend, we're sorry. We didn't mean to. We didn't no, know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then the the last year was I think 2016. Uh, was the last year we did it, and that was we changed the name to DJ House Party uh, to try to make things better. Uh, and we just decided it didn't have the same punch that it used to, so we we quit it after 2016. Oh, but that ran for several years. It had a good life. Yeah, seven. I think it was seven years. Yeah, we did it. Yeah, because like you said, it didn't have that traveling effect. But I mean, right. So I'm not going to lie. I was only, I, for me personally, I remember going the last year. <laughs> it was the only time I ever had a chance to go. But I think it was a very interesting concept because it kind of had like a feel for an exchange. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was very much, I think what was successful about the name DJ House Party is the concept of like all these baller DJs that you guys are friends with. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of like an event for them, like an exchange for them. Exactly to be on, what it was. To, like they're the on a platform <laughs> and yes. to like play music that and then just kind of like the trade-off in a sense like you would think how musicians would but it's with music like with their mm -hmm. djing and it was it was really cool because there was also fun excursions and then if you guys are familiar watchers of sons like that would be in the upstairs area but in the uh, bowling alley you guys would set up into this like really cool bohemian style living room showing mm -hmm. movies and mm -hmm. things and of course the bar is open so you could buy drinks and snacks or even just bring stuff in but it was just really neat just the setup it's very yeah. different from like what we like experience from normal events like at a hotel or like at this right. venue stuff. it was really immersive and you kind of got a. it was a i felt like a very successful blending of getting to know the city as well as we yeah. happen to be dancing but the focus was also on the djs and their enjoyment of what they like to play yeah we had uh one of the one of the main impetus the impetus for this was actually me talking with another D two other DJs. One of them is in Dallas, Tina Davis, as well as mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Watkins in San Francisco. And we were at an event in San Francisco that was a weekend house party. It was literally a party at somebody's house that went on three nights in a row. 
Um, and we decided, we thought, well, this would be great. We'll just have, well, it'd be really cool if me and you and Tina and these other DJs that we like, we could get together. And quite honestly, we could have a party where we could all get together and just have a good time because we love each other to death. And we just can't, we love to sit around and play music together and just have a good time. And then we'll just have people come and dance to our music. And so it, it truly was designed to be a party for the DJs. Mm -hmm. Um with other people there, you know, that were just partaking. And so the concept at Sons of having, well, you're dancing in the living room or, you know, you're dancing in the, in the party room upstairs. And then the living room is where the TV is. And there were games and things you could play and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So you had a, an area that was like the living room of your house. And then you had the kitchen slash bar that you could go in and give grab you a drink or order some food to be brought in. So yeah. we tried to emulate a, a quote house uh, that just happened to be you know ten thousand square feet. Yeah, um, and we had um, one of my favorite things to do was the changing rooms. We took old sheets and we hung them up and created divided areas for the ladies and the men to be able to change because there were costumes every night every night was a costume theme and so it gave them a place to change and uh that added to the the uniqueness because you knew when you came in that the living room was going to be set up in this way so that you could you could enjoy the event without having to worry about going home to change costume yeah yeah um now we originally had it like in the afternoons, like on Saturday afternoon, it was in football season, so it'd be Saturday afternoon there'd be football games on. Yep. And in the bar you could be playing games in the you know, and on the side of the football games you could be playing board games or whatever. So it mm -hmm. truly was meant to be a, like a loungy whole weekend event where other than quite literally sleeping and bathing, you were at Suns. Yep. It it was fun. Fun. And if we could have figured out how to do sleeping and bathing, we would have we would have <laughs> We looked at the porta potty option. That yeah, we looked. Yeah. Porta showers. Porta yeah. showers. We looked at those too. Man, I was about to say it very. It very much feels like Coachella, Woodstocky, but yeah. indoor yeah, yeah, yeah. air air conditioning. Like I don't know. Maybe this could be a sell post COVID, and we all feel comfortable being around each other. Like very millennial. Yeah. Even younger, like I think it would be something that people would be into. I don't know. I have well, there's that there's that there's that whole thing where they talk about you know everybody well, every once in a while says something about I'm just going to buy this humongous house and create a dance commune. That's kind of what we what tried we to did. create. Yeah, yeah. for Maybe a weekend. We to buy sons. There you go. <laughs> Shame yeah, that's not up. happening. <laughs> cool. Um, so. I want to kind of start wrapping this up a little bit by asking you guys about some influencers in your life um, as far as like, hi, Steve. Oh, Steve is making an appearance. If you guys don't know Steve the Swing Sloth, that's actually a really, okay, before I ask this question, I know a lot of people <laughs> are really excited or confused by Steve whenever they see him on Wednesdays. He's, he's a home, he's like a staple in our community, but Kind of the backstory of like how Steve came about. Was it from the Lindy Hop cruise that you guys work or whatever? Yeah, like, can yeah. you give a little shortened version of like the genesis of Steve? Because I know I get a lot of people asking about him. Um, so we were brought onto a cruise to teach swing dancing with some other instructors. 2014. 2014. You're good at numbers. I'm not. Okay. So 2014. And Steve Conrad uh, was one of the instructors. He teaches in Phoenix, Phoenix Arizona. And so one of the excursions he went on, he got to hold a baby sloth. And he came back to the ship and he said, this was life changing. My whole world has now shifted because I held this baby sloth. And that night he danced like a three-toed sloth, very slow. So there were a handful of us that did the sloth dance with him. Every time he danced, he had a partner because we would sloth dance with him. So we finished the cruise, blah, 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 blah. Two, maybe three months later, a package arrives on our door front. Inside the package was this little guy. He didn't know how to wear clothes yet, so he was all fur. Uh, and we took him, it was a Wednesday night, and we took him to Sons with us. And we sat him up and made all kinds of 
pictures with him and played with him. Basically, adult playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so it was, it was just fun. And so everybody thought he was cute, as did we. And so we thought, well, if the two left-footed sloth, because his feet go, they don't go right, can learn to dance, so can you. And so he became the mascot. Yeah. And he since learned to wear clothes, like an appropriate dancer. Um, but he's traveled all over the world. Um, he's gone to China. He's gone to Canada. Uh, he's gone to all several. All over the U.S. All over the U.S. And, and dancers will say, I want to take Steve to this event. And so we'll pack Steve's bag because he has a wardrobe. And send him off to the event to, you know, inspire others or confuse them, depending yeah. on. He has his own Facebook page, Steve the Swing Sloth. Mm -hmm. You can go look at all of his pictures and all that kind of stuff. Yep. And he's got on his Frankie Manning overalls and his Frankie Manning button in honor of Frankie Manning. Which is a perfect site. And thank you, Steve, for being with us on this interview, of course, because <laughs> you are quite a staple. And I've danced with Steve many a times. He's a great lead. Oh, so yeah, he's there, great at the Shim Sham, too. He is really good at Shim Sham and in reverse. Like, he is yeah, just he does it in reverse. He likes to face the crowd. Mm -hmm. So he's really encouraging in that way. Um, but segue, since you mentioned Frankie overalls and the Frankie button, um, so... If you guys can give us a little insight about like some of the legends you guys might have met, like the original dancers mm -hmm. um, and things like that, or interactions or favorite moments um, that you might have had. I had a favorite so moment, and, and it was an incredibly humbling. I, I cannot express how humbling this moment was. So I was relatively new to dance, and I didn't really understand who Frankie Manning was. And here's this old man teaching a class, and it's like everybody told me I had to go to it. So it's like... Okay, I'll go. And so here's this man in there, and it's like, you know, I, I probably had age discrimination in me, and I thought, he's not going to be able to teach me anything. I was wrong. Yeah. So here I am in line, and he was doing this little move where if I'm Frankie and Jerry's me, <laughs> that you take the, the follower and bring her right in front in a, in a leap. And so he was going to demo with me, and I went, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to really, really jump. He's not going to be able to get me over there. And I just barely started, just barely started to jump, and I was in front of him. And my eyes got this big, and I went, mm -hmm. oh, I'm all kinds of wrong. I am so wrong. I am so sorry. <laughs> you are not the feeble old man I thought you were. <laughs> I was, it was so bad and I was so embarrassed. Now, of course, I never told him any of that. I have told this story before, but it, it really taught me not to make assumptions about anybody because you don't know. Mm -hmm. You absolutely don't know. And it was, it was like the sloth for Steve. It was life changing for me. That one little moment. Yeah. Very humbling. One of the things that being one of the um, organizers of the Dallas Swing Dance Society, being uh, on the board of directors and president and very visible in the Dallas Lindy Hop scene has afforded us is some amount of um, admission past the, the, the velvet rope. So, you know, we would go, like, if we go to Lindy Fest, there was often times when we would be invited to dinner over at uh, Buddy Steve's house where, he, you mm -hmm. know, they were housing Frankie and all of the, the instructors. So there were many occasions where we got the opportunity to see uh, people like Norma Miller and, and Frankie and Chaz and Don Hampton, Don Hampton um, outside of the, the quote, uh, workshop weekend uh, mm -hmm. and it was always great to just be able to sit on the couch next to Frankie Manning and and just kind of you know hello Mr. Manning you know get you, you know try to get your nerves up and he's like what are you doing you're just a uh, you know I'm just Frankie I mean it's no big deal you know <laughs> uh, and there they were very I was always struck by how humble they were about what 
they meant to our scene. Um, they didn't have a big head on their shoulders. They were just like, yeah, I danced back and with Whitey's Lindy Hoppers. I didn't, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and so, yeah, we got to, we got to meet a lot of those folks. One of the, one of the things that we also got to do, um, was that we, it was a good and a bad thing in that we got to go to Frankie 95, which originally was going to be the celebration of Frankie Manning's 95th birthday, but actually began, became a memorial to Frankie because he died a month before mm -hmm. the actual event. And we had gotten on the volunteer staff to go to that, and it was in New York City. Um, and we were put in charge of, this is a, a, a very, um, probably inappropriate way to say this, but if they were black and old, we were in, we were in charge of them. So we made sure they had anything they needed. We would escort them to where they had a special box that they got to see it was really, so they would sit there and get to talk with each other. And we basically, whatever they needed yeah. is what we did. So they had a luxury box that was there where they sat and, you know, basically instead of just making it open that people could just like crowd around them because there were 2,500 mm -hmm. people at this event after yeah. Frankie passed away. And if they didn't have a spot where they could go and, and just chill, but still be within the event, mm -hmm. They would be bombarded by people wanting to say hello and all this, which is great, but you don't want that. Yeah, yeah. Every minute. And so we we really got to um, be close to people like Norma and and Chaz, uh, even like uh, uh, Sugar Sullivan. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were there were like fifteen twenty people in this in this box that we were kind of like the the gatekeepers. And it's almost as if somebody would come up and go, and go they'd come up and they'd go, I go, who would you like to speak with? Well, we were hoping we'd get to talk with Norma. And I go, what's your name? So it's only, and I go over, hey, Norma, you know, okay, cool, you can go. You know, and so it was, it was a little bit restrictive for the 2,500 people yeah. if they wanted to come and get close to these people, but it was a huge crowd. It was a throng of people. Yeah, um, and the dance floor was incredibly dangerous. Yes. Everybody was dancing, all jam cracked. And, you know, it, it's like any dance but uh it was it was intense yeah i think one of my i i probably did not dance i might have danced two songs the whole weekend uh but i know one of favorite stories that kathy tells oh yeah is that she danced with some old timers that was i i was there for the whole weekend was it four days or yeah yeah some, it was like four days and so i only danced one night and on that one night I said, I am only going to dance with the older black men because they know what this dance is supposed to be. And all I've ever done is learn from instructors who learned it. It's, it's different when you develop a dance versus you're learning a dance that was developed decades ago. And it's like, if I'm going to have two or three songs in this whole weekend, it's going to be with the old timers. And it was another humbling, eye-opening experience because their swing ops were not, you know, predictable because they were going with the musicality that they were hearing. And it, it was the idea of don't worry about the one through the eight. Just dance. Listen mm -hmm. to your leader. The leader listens to the follow. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. So even though I got very few dances, dancing with those old gentlemen was... Um, old gentlemen, older men, older gentlemen was phenomenal. And uh, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Yeah. And part of that was made possible through Dallas Swing Dance Society. Mm -hmm. um, they gave us a grant to help pay for things. The Houston Swing Dance Society uh, helped pay for us to go up there. We, This was uh, in 2009, and Kathy and I had both lost our job, our corporate jobs, mm -hmm. our last corporate job, so we really weren't in a position to be able to afford to go to it. And when the Houston Swing Dance folks said, found out we weren't going, they didn't see us on the list. They said, why aren't you going to Frankie 95? And we're like, we can't. We lost our jobs. We can't afford it. <laughs> well, you should have said something. And so uh, they made it happen. Dallas Swing Dance Society made it happen. Mm -hmm. So... Um, 
it, it, it will always, I will always be thankful for those two organizations for allowing us to be part of an event, which I, you know, was just absolutely uh, mind blowing. Yeah. yeah. To see the, the square footage of dancers. <laughs> it's like, it's like, how can that many people be dancing all at the same time? It was, you know, mm. I keep using the word phenomenal, but, um, and there's no words really. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, Don Hampton, one of our favorites. Oh yeah. We love that lady. Um, you know, we brought her in. Uh, DSDS agreed, so Jerry was oh, yeah, president. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. And she was having a birthday, and we wanted to celebrate her birthday, so we we compiled a plan to uh, bring her in. So Acme Swing Company was part of that. DSDS was part of that. Jerry and I were part of that. Mm -hmm. And we brought her in for a week. And so she taught at a workshop for for DSDS. And I believe she taught uh, with she taught it, uh, Acme. Yes. Oh, maybe so. But then um, she also did at uh, Booker T. Washington. Yeah. She did a, a class for the dancers there. She went over to Fort Worth, and I cannot remember the name of the... Uh, the uh, performing arts school in Fort Worth, but she went over there and did a class mm -hmm. with them. Uh, there was a young lady there that was moved to tears uh, in, in watching and taking that class from uh, Dawn because she, had, she was about ready to quit. She couldn't find the spark that made her want to continue dancing. And this is a, you know, a 15 year old. Uh, and mm -hmm. listening to Dawn Hampton tell her story was what she needed to be able to go. Uh, you've inspired me. She had tears running down her eye. It was just she was a mess. Yeah. She was she was so sad and happy at the same time that she got the message when she needed to get the message. And Dawn was such a sweetheart um, yeah. about all of that. She just spread the joy. And having her here for a week was and then we fabulous had, for us. And then we had uh, two amazing, absolutely probably. Uh, two of the very best nights of of swing and jazz music oh, I think will ever happen in Dallas um, was that was, was that weekend we actually flew in Wycliffe Gordon from uh, New York who is her favorite one of her favorite mm -hmm. musicians and we had the top jazz artist from Dallas Fort Worth put together a band uh, and it was just phenomenal the the music that they played i wish there was recordings of oh yeah of you know of that night because it was the, those two nights because it was two nights of music mm -hmm. put on by the same band yeah the um it was the first and only time i have heard a drum solo that you could swing dance to and not worry about the the, the drummer going what i call crazy it's fabulous drumming I, my brain can't follow it um, but he played a melody on his drums, on his drum solo. Andrew. Andrew, yeah, Andrew Griffith. Yeah. And it's like, I don't even know how he did that. I said, how did he do that? And But I was dancing to it. I was loving it. I was going to say, shameless side note, Andrew is a genius that yes. Yes. if you guys can ever get an Andrew, uh, oh, what is his last name? Andy. Griffith. 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 Yeah. Yep. Um, friends, once COVID is over, or if you happen to look around, Balcony Club is, I know, one place he plays often. Mm -hmm. He plays with mm -hmm. a lot of local greats like Shelly Carroll and some other people sometimes. But I mean, when they're describing like those sounds, sorry to kind of take it away from the dancing, but just like the way he can manipulate the sounds of the drums with his elbow yep. and stuff, you're just like, who is this man? So when she's saying that, I'm just adding an extra two cents, like, yes. Yeah, yep. but you know, Don Hampton that would not have happened had she not been here and had she not told us what she wanted she spoke up she said okay but this is the band i want i want a band like this and i want this guy from new york yeah. to be there yeah and it was it's like okay and just more two cents for our audience because i know we might have said this also with the last interview with elaine but that Dawn also was a musician in her own right. Like she was right. a musician oh, yeah. before she was a dancer. So just to reiterate, like when she talks about what she wants with the music, like she knows what she's talking about because that is her history. She was a diva. Before she was, oh gosh, yeah. Yeah. There was a, she was another lady that when I met her, it's like, she, you know, 
we get older and we don't look the same as we did. But so when I met her, she had already aged to the point where she had a stoop and she walks with a strut with a little bit of shuffle. Her dancing was still amazing. Um, but I didn't know how hot this woman was until we started digging through her photographs to do promotions and stuff. And it's like, oh my God, she was a hot tomato back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing just like those instances. Cause that's, I think that's the thing is just for our viewers to realize it's like um, how long, or at least for DSDS and just in general, like the involvement of the Metroplex of like how we even partnered with other events, IE or other groups like Houston and mm -hmm. things like that to, you know, just to support people and to be able to encourage people to go to various events and stuff. And I know I've benefited from, other organizations and DSDS, but just that, that's still the narrative, which is very encouraging, yeah. at least I've for always, me um, how we support. I've always held the belief that in a, in a scene like Dallas, Fort Worth, or even our bigger national scene, there are enough dancers for every organization. So if we as organizations work together, if Fort Worth needs us, or we need Fort Worth or Denton or whatever, if we don't step on each other's events by creating another event if we cross promote for each other there will be enough dancers for all of it because there will be more opportunities for people to find us to find the dance and dallas fort worth denton has always done a really pretty good job at being respectful for each other's events mm -hmm. and dances and the ability to work together like that has always been amazing mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Cool. So to wrap things up, I kind of have some lightning non-dance related type questions and yeah, we'll just see what happens. Okay. Because okay. these are just things that pop in my head and don't have to overthink it. Just like say whatever comes out of your mouth. Um, and I think what we'll do is like, I'll ask the question, we'll have Kat then Jerry answer. Cool. Oh yeah. God. Cool. <laughs> All right. They're just, just fun little facts. Don't worry about it. So favorite color. Oh, uh, it was purple, but it is now a bright lime green. Uh, was blue probably now towards teal. <laughs> That's awesome, the Genesis. That's cool, cool, cool. Favorite food? Oh, gosh, salmon. Every day, salmon. Uh, chicken strips with gravy. Nice. And pardon that snort, but if you know me, I snort like no other. Favorite cocktail? Oh, a dirty gin martini. Slightly, slightly dirty gin martini. Wow, there's so many. He likes them all. Do it. That's <laughs> why I said when he said tequila, I was like, I got a question for you. Oh, yeah. no, no tequila for Kathy. No, 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 no. no tequila. <laughs> Kat doesn't. No. Um, <laughs> I would probably go more towards something like um, um, oh, gosh, that's really tough. <laughs> I got. I mean, it's like I drink a lot of the same things until I get tired of it. Um, so there has been, like, over the years, more popular drinks throughout the swing scene. Yeah. And something will go out of vogue and something else will pick up. And, you know, it's so. Yeah. At Sun's, my my go-to drink is, has been for several years, Diet Coke and uh, Tito's Vodka. There you go. That is very classic, Jerry. Um, let's see. Favorite song. It doesn't have to be swing related or it might be a swing song, but favorite song. Okay. This isn't a swing song, but it's a song that when Jerry plays it, I have to Lindy hop to it, which it's like, can you actually be Lindy hopping to this song? Eh, that's one of those musicality questions that you say, no, you're not Lindy hopping because it's not swing music, blah, blah, blah. But beside that. LaGrange by ZZ Top. I will swing out so hard and so fast and have so much fun in that song. And I don't know why. I just love it. Uh, maybe not my favorite song, but that is one song that will get me up on the dance floor. Uh, my favorite song to swing dance to is probably Sounds Like True Religion by Arlington Jones. Oh gosh, Jones. I love that one too. Uh, local artist. Um, my Favorite jam is probably uh, Back in the Day by Wayne Brady. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. 
Uh, favorite singer or musician? I cannot answer that. <laughs> I, I'm going to pass. What? That's okay. Uh, <laughs> local singer, non big, huge, famous would be Ricky Derrick. Oh, yeah. He's uh, fun. Not a, a national musician would probably be, um, I don't know, Frank Sinatra, probably. Yeah. Which fits Ricky Derrick. So. Yeah, I mean, it's the same style <laughs> of music either way. I was going to say, pretty much almost one and the same. Very crooner-like. Um, what is your favorite dance move? Move? Oh, dance mm -hmm. move? Yeah. I absolutely love a good swing out. Really, I mean, because you can do so much with it. Um, tuck double spin. I love a tuck turn with a double spin. Hmm. Uh, probably Jerry and Kathy's signature move. Oh. Which is a Texas, uh, a, let me see. It's a Texas, you remember Texas Tommy. It? Texas, <laughs> Tom, Texas Tommy with a double spin on I the end. I forgot about that one. Oh, wow. I was about to say, I was like, I've there's, never heard this one. There's oh, a cool. technique of getting the double spin to happen without the girl knowing or the follower knowing it's, it's coming. But it is so smooth when it happens, you can't help but double spin. Yes, that one's quite fun. Oh, I remember it. That quite was, delightful. I remember the, the one in front. It's actually the Frisbee flick into the Texas Tommy with the double spin. That's, there you go. Wow, that sounds like a you good said. IHOP or like Waffle House order also. Like, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, I'll have a double decaf, non-whip foam latte. <laughs> I like to spin. So any move with spins, I'm good. Cool. And then I'll finally. Like, I like to work that skirt. Oh. <laughs> oh, <Jerry. laughs> Sorry. Oh, swords. <laughs> you know what? In future videos, no, it's still going to be there. That's just yeah. plain. <laughs> it's part of your charm. <laughs> <laughs> thanks thanks so much um final question or just statement question no it's a question that's why there's a question mark by it a piece of advice for a new dancer what would be like that one piece of advice to give a new dancer um you're doing this for fun you're doing this for fun yeah that's good advice um having fun can mean a lot of different things it can mean you want to learn more uh what it doesn't mean is if if you don't look like the dancer you admire it does not matter mm -hmm. are you having fun with the dancer that you are mm -hmm. then that's what we need that's what you need that's what we need it's about fun this is this is not supposed to be a stressful and you know a stressful mm -hmm. thing it's supposed to relieve all that stress yeah yeah um mine's going to be pretty close to the same thing because i feel like that if you do not well, my life, my life lesson in general is you've got to love yourself before you, anybody else can love you. Okay. Um, if you don't love yourself, then why would anybody else? And that kind of expands into the swing dance world too. I've mm -hmm. seen lots of guys who try to get love, you know, I will say love. I've had, I've had guys ask me about, you know, they'll be dancing. What do you think? How do I, how did I look? Uh, it doesn't matter what I think. Uh, how did you feel? No, no. I'm, how mm -hmm. did it? How did, do you like this outfit I'm wearing? I, it doesn't matter. Do you like this outfit you're wearing? You got to yeah. love yourself before other people can love you. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you take that from the dance floor to your relationships, same thing. Um, I always one of the things that I discovered in going through a divorce was that I learned how to love being by myself, going to dinner by yourself, going to a movie by yourself, going and just doing things by yourself and really enjoying doing that kind of thing. Um, and once you bring that into the dance world, mm -hmm. then you don't, I'll quite honestly, you don't look, you don't look and feel needy to the people that are around you. You're not trying to mm -hmm. suck things out of other people so that you can feel good. As long as you feel good yourself, That's other good. people will see it and recognize yeah. it. Oh, I do have one bit of advice. Learn enough to not hurt your partner. And that goes for leaders and followers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or you'll see my medical bill. And on yeah. that note. <laughs> and lady, uh, I, and ladies, never dip yourself. Oh, gosh, please don't do that. <laughs> that's real. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> or you're going to see the medical bills. Still. Oh, the medical bills yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Very the cool. only time Jerry's ever been hurt in swing dancing is when the uh, the ladies that are like 100 pounds or less throw themselves into a dip because they're tiny. Yeah, No, don't do that. <laughs> I don't carry around 100 pounds tax of taters all the time. So. <laughs> That's that's fact. I mean, in general, it's just like, yeah, just don't don't force it upon anyone. Just like feel the groove, dance it. Yeah. Don't Very have cool. fun. Be safe. And kids, stay in school. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk with us about your journey and giving us your story about your involvement with dancing and also just the community here in Dallas are really appreciative. And I hope this encourages other people to get to know you more. And honestly, cause you guys are really cool people to just talk to and hang out um, and just certain plugs um, because I also work with Kathy and Jerry and know like side gigs and things that they're doing. Um, but check out um, on Wednesdays, Jerry has been doing a live DJ um, during these COVID times um, from his house. And so he's playing a lot of good music. And you also have the opportunity to even chat with him <laughs> while he's doing it, which is not normal whenever um, he's DJing. And you can actually make requests, and I usually take them. <laughs> exactly. So Jerry's been doing that. And then also Kathy is also a very proficient artist and is a sculptor. And so you guys should check out the Art Way Life. And we'll probably Art put a link for that. Um, the back of her <laughs> cell phone there um we'll definitely try to put those links up um for you guys to check out just to kind of support them in other ways because again they're humans they have other hobbies and other interests but i definitely want to help promote my friends in that way too and i know kathy kathy are you still carving outside of your house i am i'm, okay. I'm building a patio right now out there with the help of some friends so that i can help teach kids how to carve as well but yeah i'll be Starting next week, I'll be carving in the front yard every every weekday. Very cool, guys. And just so you guys have a good understanding of that um, in relation to time, just in case you watch this in the future, next week being Sunday, oh, good idea. the 30th. So just so depending on when you watched it or again, just check out the Artway Life and also her Instagram. Again, we'll put all those links under the description area just so you guys can stay tuned with what these cool people, these cool artists are doing. Um, in the meantime but again thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk with us and to share Absolutely. your story cool well take care good night everybody one lucky day you came my way i never knew what love was all about until i met you